it's this idea that in Willard, it's one of our and Daniel's probably favorite quote, mine and Daniel's probably favorite quote in the book. It's becoming the kind of person that can fulfill the law. That's the goal. It's not that you, it's not that you then can check off that you did or didn't do the 10 commandments or the, the things Jesus specifically says, even in the Sermon on the Mount, it's not the end of the day of like, Oh, well I got angry. So like knock off that. Like I didn't do that. It's like, no, are you becoming the kind of person that no longer submits to your anger? Welcome to the Belfast Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Byler, here with Daniel. And this week, we're moving on to Chapter 8 of The Divine Conspiracy, talking about what it means uh, to be a disciple. Uh, before we get on to specifically Chapter 8 content here, uh, I want to give a little bit of a summary of what we talked about in Chapter 7. Uh, I think maybe one of the more most important chapters we've talked about so far, maybe besides Chapter 2 or 3. Um, but it was a community of prayerful love. And um, one of the reasons I think it was so important is because it touched on a lot of stuff we've spoken of before this, which was um, there's a reason that Jesus talks about things in the order that he talks about them. Um, like, like I've kept saying, you cannot hope to love your enemies if you can't forgive your brother. And so that was much of what's talked about in the beginning of chapter seven is uh a community without condemnation. We talked about the nature of condemnation. Jesus' words of uh, judge not lest you be judged, how those are taken out of context so often, and how once we have gotten past, we'll talk about this a little bit in these episodes here, but once we've been able to do to not judge, once we've been able to put away our anger and our contempt and our lust and our uh, pride and our need to make ourselves sound more trustworthy than we really are, then we can really engage in being a community of prayerful love and being the body of Christ. And so we're moving on here in chapter eight to discuss specifically what it looks like when Willard keeps using this language of being a disciple, being a student of Jesus. What does he mean? What does that look like? Um, and if we have been able to put away those things and become part of a community, then being a disciple is going to be the natural next step of what happens for us. And hopefully what's happened for you, what's happening for me, what's happening for Daniel. And so um, to start here, I want to read again from just the very beginning of the chapter. And Willard points out something that he's pointed out before, but I think it bears repeating. And that is, he says, One thing is sure. You are someone's disciple. You learn how to live from someone else. There are no exceptions to this rule. For human beings are just the kind of creatures that have to learn and keep learning from others how to live. Aristotle remarked that we owe more to our teachers than our parents. For though our parents gave us life, our teachers taught us the good life. Today, especially in Western cultures, we prefer to think that we are our own person. We make up our own minds. But that is only because we have been mastered by those who have taught us that we do or should do so. Such individualism is a part of the legacy that makes us modern. But we certainly did not come by that individualistic posture through our own individual and independent insight into ultimate truth. And Willard's point here is just that that we are all, as his first line says, you are someone's disciple. You learn from somebody. The question is, who is that? Um, but I think it's crucial, before we talk about what it means to be Jesus' disciple, to be a part of his church, to realize the fact that this is happening to us everywhere all the time. And he says later on page 326, you don't drift into discipleship. Um, it's a deliberate and difficult choice you must constantly make. If we are not being active 
and our formation, then we are passively letting other things form us into their image. So and this is an interesting an interesting bit to, um, so that last bit you read from our notes, that wasn't yeah. actually Willard. No, um, that was you. Yeah, that, that was me. So he he sets up this, and it's kind of subtle. He doesn't draw this necessarily explicitly, um, but this, like, two, two states of being that we have. We are constantly being formed by things and people around us and the culture in which we live. And yet, we don't just accidentally drift into purposeful discipleship or discipleship aimed at the kingdom of God, right? And so we can either remain in a state of passivity, being passively um, formed and discipled by the air and atmosphere around us, culturally speaking, or we can be active by taking account of that formation and deliberately setting ourselves in contexts and in situations and with people who can counteract the bad things in our culture that seek to form us and also produce in us good fruit to bear, good discipleship, good development and formation of our souls and of our beings. And so we have to make the, the active choice to be discipled, because if we don't, discipleship will happen to us passively, and it will be a, a malformation of who we are. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Point being, you're always learning from something or someone. Whether you account for it or not. Right. And to account for it is better because then you can be intentional about the ways you're being formed. So um, he says on page 309, a disciple or apprentice is simply someone who decides to be with another person under the appropriate conditions in order to become capable of doing what that person does or becoming what that person is. And so that's that active piece, right? We have to be with someone, so in their presence, in order to grow from where we are towards being able to do what it is they want to do. And, mm -hmm. and that takes intentionality. <clears throat> so, Luke, do you want to talk a little bit about the Jesus as teacher one more time? Yes, and I'm trying to find the exact quote here. Um, in the book. Okay. Um, so we've what talked... Heading, what heading was... Go ahead and intro. What heading was that under? The elephant in the church? Is that what it was under? Um, I don't think so. The 329 quote? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. Mm, okay. Um, you can just read it. I won't have to yeah. show it. I can't find okay. it on the exact page, but That's um, he has another quote here that I might read depending on how this bit here goes, but okay. go ahead and, and hit us with this idea. Cause I think this is, this runs into this. We're, we're going to hit back on ideas we hit in chapter two here. Yeah. Um, and how this ties into being discipled and being Jesus disciple. So go ahead. So, and th this is really important. So chapter two is about gospels of sin management and the way that Willard describes these Gospels of Sin Management is they exist in kind of two forms in the church nowadays. Um, there's the one side that sees um, the gospel as a message of personal salvation for the forgiveness of my sins. So I get scanned like a barcode when I go through heaven's gates and I'm accepted into God's like. This is the party. forensic nature of salvation made yeah. the only thing about salvation. Yeah, it's the only thing about God's kingdom and Jesus coming in incarnation that matter is that mm -hmm. I get included in the after party of life. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, that's the right leaning gospel of sin management. The left leaning one is about um, fixing social problems and creating a social order that helps produce justice and righteousness. And again, it's not that either of these things are bad. It's just they're not actually the gospel itself 
their consequences of the gospel, as we've discussed in chapter two. Um, but this it's crucial to see how Jesus as teacher, the, or the lack of Jesus as teacher, right? We've also talked about the, the case of the missing teacher with Jesus mm -hmm. a lot. And so the lack of Jesus as teacher, I think, naturally produces these things as their byproduct. Right. So <clears throat> um, I'll just read the quote from 329. Willard says, and with the disappearance of Jesus as teacher replaced by the mere sacrificial lamb. So that's the right leaning gospel of sin management that sees us as being scanned with a barcode into heaven as the only point of mm -hmm. Jesus coming. And the main thing that the kingdom of God is designed to do. Or else, this is Willard, or else the prophet of a social and personal liberation, right? So the social gospel that liberates us from the ills of society mm -hmm. and the evil structures that we've created, which, I mean, legitimate, right? That's that's a fair critique. It's part of the malformation of our culture, right? Is producing disciples of things that are not of the kingdom passively. That's what we were just talking about. So I'll read the whole quote again. And with the disappearance of Jesus as teacher, replaced by the mere sacrificial lamb, or else the prophet of social and personal liberation, the left or the right, Gospels of Sin Management, the prospect of making disciples to him becomes very dim indeed. You cannot have students if you have no teacher. Yeah, because either you have your ticket to heaven mm -hmm. or the means by which you fix society. Yes. So you don't have a teacher who's actually going to help take the principles of heaven, embody them on earth in a way that's transformative and points us back up towards heaven, right? That's this whole incarnation, life, death, resurrection, and ascension piece that Jesus walks through that we as his disciples are called to walk through as well. And so that's the, this disappearance of Jesus as teacher produces this gospel of sin management, and these gospels of sin management then produce a lack of discipleship in the church because they're not aimed at actually producing disciples. Right. They're aimed at either getting to heaven, right. your, your ticket through the doorway, or the creation of a utopian state. So instead, we need to reframe, reshape, readjust, and aim towards what Jesus called us to, and that's a discipleship. So um, I don't know, Luke, if you have anything else to add on that, uh, or we can just go I have a to the... I have a quote here from 329, but I'll, I might okay. save that for later. Okay. It might fit better somewhere else. So Okay. So... Um, on page 310, Willard's, we're going to talk a little bit now about um, what does it mean to be a disciple? So what is the, we've talked a lot so about we're all learning from somebody. We're being yes. discipled. We are being we, discipled. We want to be discipled by Jesus, which has to be done out of the context of each gospel of sin management, because in either there is no teacher. Yes. This is his case for the, the case of the missing teacher. Um, and it's phrase, uh, that always sticks with me and always convicting. We are willing to learn from almost anyone but him. Yeah. And so what does it look like when you really want to learn how to live your life from Jesus is the question. What does it mean to be someone like that? Yeah. So I'll just read the quote here uh, on page 310. I'm learning from Jesus to live my life as he would live my life if he were me. I am not necessarily learning to do, um, yeah, to do everything he did, but I am learning how to do everything I do in the manner that he did all that he did. Mm -hmm. So that gets a little repetitive, a little kind of hard to follow, maybe if you're just reading and not, or if you're just listening and not reading. So I'll, I'll say it again. Well, I'll say it and I'll explain bits of it. So I'm learning from Jesus to live my life as he would live my life if he were me. So it's not about me becoming 
an ascetic Jewish man in the first century wandering around the Galilee and Judea with a band of 12 men with me. Right. That's not the goal. The goal is how do I go and work my nine to five as an incarnation? I'm not saying we are the incarnation, but as an incarnation right. of Christ in my workplace. I am not necessarily learning learning to do everything he did, right? That's the not, <laughs> not you aren't being, Jesus. I, I am not sense. Jesus, and I am not called necessarily, though maybe, to wander around Galilee, right? But I am learning how to do everything I do in the manner that he did all that he did. So can I, in my day-to-day, -day, when I wake up, when my wife and I have breakfast, when I go to work, when I'm in a meeting with a coworker, when I'm presenting that PowerPoint that I've been working on all week, when it doesn't go as well as I wanted it to, when I am on break and I'm eating my lunch and I pass a coworker in the hallway, am I being Christ in all of those situations? And how am I being formed to be more like Christ in all of those situations. Right. That's the question. It's Peterson. Peterson talks about this in terms of like of meta rules, right? This is what mm -hmm. Willard's getting at here. Yeah. This is what Jesus is getting at the Sermon on the Mount. You know, you've heard that it was said, but I say to you, right? This very specific thing. Um, you've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye tooth for a tooth but i tell you whoever's angry so it's not just the action of revenge it's the state of hatred mm -hmm. that leads to revenge it's the thing that's underneath that as we'll get to here in a little bit it's the fruit that the tree produces right it's the spring that should be a spring of living water um so it's this idea that, and Willard said, it's one of our and Daniel's probably favorite quote, mine and Daniel's probably favorite quote in the book. It's becoming the kind of person that can fulfill the law. Yeah. That's the goal. It's not that you, it's not that you then can check off that you did or didn't do the Ten Commandments or the, the things Jesus specifically says, even in the Sermon on the Mount. It's not the end of the day of like, oh, well, I got angry. So like, knock off that. Like, I didn't do that. It's like, no, are you becoming the kind of person that no longer submits to your anger? Mm -hmm. Or or your lust or your envy or your pride or whatever it might be. And so in being and learning how learning from Jesus, how to live my life as he would live my life if he were me. That's what Jesus sends us in ends this sermon with whoever hears these words and does them is like a wise man so if you want to know what god what jesus wants your life to look like how he would live your life if he were you i think he would do what he said well that's a good metric too i mean if you want a really good metric for am i making progress on trying to be you know, more formed into the image of Christ. I mean, this is what Paul talks about, yeah. right? Be conformed to the image of the Son, right? If you want a good metric, you can just think, okay, that that interaction with that coworker when I was frustrated didn't go quite like I wanted it to, right? Quite like quite like it should have if I was Jesus. Now. We can have a distorted image of what Jesus would have done. And I know some people who I think do. Yeah. But by and large, I think at least having that check in the back of our minds is something that can really help us, help take us a long way. And so <clears throat> I, I want to read this, this next Willard quote, the Go short ahead. one. Yeah. It's on, it's on the following page, uh, 311. He says, my discipleship to Jesus is within clearly definable limits, not a matter of what I do, but how I do it. Right. 
So what he's talking about here is discipleship in this kind of frame of mind, it really, and this is linked to the Jesus as teacher and not getting caught up in the gospels of sin management bit. It's not about the ends. It's about the means and the means themselves actually become the ends, mm -hmm. right? So the ends cannot justify the means because the means themselves are those ends. And what I mean by that is in the gospels of sin management, be it personal escapist salvation or utopian liberation. Yeah. It's all about the final product that gets produced. Right. I will scare people with hell if that makes them pray a prayer and be saved so that yes. they will then go to heaven. Yes. And even if I have a proper doctrine of hell, like I'm not going to debate the doctrine of yeah, hell right yeah. now, even assuming like your doctrine of hell is. Or as pick one. It doesn't, I don't, get. in yeah. this example, it doesn't matter. Like yes. if that's your, if your end is sin management in the sense of like, well, I just need them to get forgiven so that they can go to this place and not that place then you will use whatever means to scare or entice yes to get that result yes or if you're you know socially engineering mm -hmm. to fix whatever the problem that you see is that Jesus is addressing maybe real or fake yep. then you will use co coercion and um iron fistedness to to do that you're being shame, a little bit guilt. more more polite than I would have been too. You'll use gas chambers and killing fields. Yeah. As the 20th century is a very good example of to socially engineer and produce the societal utopia that you're aiming for. Right. And that's why these gospels of sin management are so dangerous. And that's why defining it this way with this discipleship formation transformational piece at its center as citizens of the kingdom of god is so important now i can get on a high horse about that there is another little piece of this that i also want to make clear explicit um this also means that discipleship is not a call to ministry yeah Right. So implicit in all of the examples that I've been using, it assumes that you're not working as a pastor or a, an employee of a church. This is you're working your normal nine to five and you're being Jesus in that everyday space. Yeah. And so. I know a lot of churches and church cultures where the path is always a call to ministry. Yep. And if you don't feel called to ministry, then you're kind of seen as a second class citizen in the church. Right. And this, this piece about discipleship actually almost demonstrates the opposite. So the real work actually happens out in the world and you go to church to be formed that way when you go back out in the world you can do the real work right <clears throat> and i think uh i think i'll read that other quote real quick it's i have 29 but that's why really this is so important anyway sorry yeah so back to this idea of student disciple doing as jesus would do live in our life as if jesus were me uh, i guess i'll share my screen real quick because i have it up willard says and at present and the distant outworking of the protestant reformation with this truly great and good message of salvation by faith alone that long accepted division has worked its way into the very heart of the gospel message it is now understood to be part of the good news that one does not have to be a life student of Jesus in order to be a Christian and receive forgiveness of sins. This gives a precise meaning to the phrase cheap grace, though it will be better described as 
costly faithlessness. And the point here is not that your works are the thing that earn your salvation, but that how you live determines who you will become. And the point, as we've been hammering on this idea in the Ser Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, is the goal is to be the wise man, hear these words and do them. Build your house on the rock and become the kind of person that Jesus wants us to be. We're actually going to bring this quote back up later in a couple of episodes. And so it's it's this exact concept. It'll reappear as we get further along in the discipleship conversation. But yeah, that is a really important thing to keep in mind is um, and again, cheap grace is the opposite side of the coin of costly faithlessness. Right. And yeah, how costly that might be, I don't know. But none of this means that you have to be in vocational ministry to be a disciple of Jesus or a student of Jesus or live the life he would want you to live. Yep. Okay. So, so, what is this? so we've talked <laughs> about you're all being discipled by somebody. Being a disciple of Jesus means that you do what he says, live your life as if he were you. But what does that mean? What we're going to move on to here at the end of this discussion is what does that mean? Because as Willard points out here, he says, but if I am to be someone's apprentice, there is one absolute essential condition. I must be with that person. And we'll talk about some of the ways in which this works itself out. But what does it mean then to be with Jesus as we are being his disciple. I think that's that's what we're going to tackle here for, for a couple of minutes. So do you want to read the next quote, Dan, or do you have anything to say on that? I, I can. Um, we're, as we keep moving forward, um, one of the things to keep in mind is this concept right here gets touched on even more in chapter nine. So when we get to chapter nine, we're going to hammer this home, I think, a lot. But I'll, I'll read this bit from page 303. Um, he says, if I am Jesus' disciple, that means I am with him to learn from him how to be like him. And so that means that we... Well, we're called to spend time with Jesus. Now, <clears throat> this needs to be practical, not just theological or metaphysical. Um, it's it's something that it needs to be tangible. Jesus came down incarnate, not just so that we could be exposed to new ideas, but to be with us. Yeah. Right. And so being a part of the body of Christ now is a very practical way in which we can experience the incarnate presence of Christ. Right. Now. So that's, that is an important piece to this formational bit is being a part of a church community, one that's oriented properly and aimed towards moral formation and transformation of its members further and further into the image of Christ. Right. That's the objective. Right. And you, you know could say, <clears throat> how are you, you could say, well, Dan, you're, you're, you're making it sound like spending time with God and spending time in the church is exactly the same thing. And I'd say, yes, because this is what Lewis talks about. I read this a couple weeks ago and, um, and the weight of glory, Lewis's point is the weight of glory of your neighbor. Right? He says next, he says next to the Eucharist, your neighbor might be the most holy thing that you encounter because Christ is in him. We confess this as Christians, 
They bear the image of God. We'll talk about that in a second, what that means. One of the things that that could mean for us, um, to bear God's name or bear his image. But we think as fellow believers, they Christ is in them. So when we do good things towards them or they do good things to us, they are being Christ. We are seeing Christ in them. That is the same spending time and being with and being formed by those people is the same thing then as being with Christ. Now, being with all the Christians, all the little Christ is like being with Christ. Yes. So this is why it's important to have an accountability partner or have a confessor or be under a pastor and have discipleship. That's not just you with, uh, you know, ooey gooey feelings in your closet. Like that might be good. And, you know, glory to God, if you, if you have that, that's great, but let's not, let's not make this all mystical and not practical of like, well, that's somehow different than me being a part of the church. Yes. So, and again, we'll get to this in chapter nine, Willard then takes this into the closet, into the prayer room, right? Right. Into the silence and solitude, the, the necessity for that. And so there, there is a place for that, but right. it's important to be with the body of Christ to be with Christ too. Um, yeah. I just, I want to hammer that because yes, I think many, yes. many no, people I'm... think of me spending time with Jesus as my cup of coffee and my Bible in the morning. And that's good. Yes. Keep doing yes. that. Yes. And keep praying. But also spending time with Jesus is whatever time you meet with your small group Bible study or whatever time that you and your accountability partner hang out or whatever time you go to confession or, you know, whatever tradition might be like, yeah. these are all ways in which you are being with Christ because you're being with his church or with his body. You're with his people, the people that bear his image that have the Holy spirit. Yep. So you're with him. Yep. Let's, so let's not think of those things as totally opposite or totally different. So let me read this, this other quote real quick. Um, let's see if we have enough time to finish this up. Anyone who is not a continual student of Jesus and who nevertheless reads the great promises of the Bible as if they were for him or her is like someone trying to cash a check on another person's account. At best, it succeeds only sporadically. The effect of such continual study under Jesus would naturally be that we learn how to do everything we do in the name of the Lord Jesus, Colossians 3.17. That is, on his behalf or in his place. That is, once again, as if he himself were doing it. Now think about this, right? In the Ten Commandments, we are told not to take the Lord's name in vain. What that really practically means is that as we are ambassador, it doesn't mean you don't say God's name. It doesn't just mean that you don't say God's name flippantly. Right. Or that you use it to curse someone instead of bless them. Right. Right. It does include that. Right. But that's actually included in a much broader category that we ignore oftentimes. Taking the Lord's name in vain means bearing his reputation poorly in ways that don't accurately reflect his character. Right. And so anytime that you as a Christian are acting as a Christian on behalf of Christ, you have the, the great risk of bearing his name in vain. If you don't portray his character properly. Right. That's a heavy, heavy weight to carry. And thank God there's grace for when we all inevitably drop that ball. Yes. And yet, it doesn't mean that we are not called, literally in the Ten Commandments, to meet that with responsibility. And so as we, as ambassadors of Christ, when we go out into the world, 
We're to be discipled so that we can bear his name well. Right. That's a part of witnessing, right? And again, let's just think about this in terms of what we've been talking about this whole time, what Willard's been pointing out to us. If we are the type of people who want to forgive our enemies but can't forgive our brothers, who have to say, I swear to this is a way you would take God's name in vain. I swear to God, I will do da 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 da. What does Jesus say? Do you not think that you you swearing by the throne the the temple or the throne of God or even the hairs on your head can add weight to your words? Don't use those things to make you sound more trustworthy. Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. But we will appeal to these things to make us sound better as we will appeal to our our thoughts on things, our, our positions, whatever they might be, to make us sound good. But if we're doing these things, we are bearing... We aren't bearing his name, right? We haven't learned how to be his disciple. But if we learn to forgive our brothers, if we learn to just say yes when we mean yes and no when we mean no, and then people believe us. So we don't need to add anything. Right? Yep. So We aren't flaky. We're honest. For sake of time, I'm going to skip the next quote and just talk about this last one. We can wrap that one into something else Um, on page 309 willard says to be a disciple in any area or relationship is not to be perfect one can be a very raw and incomplete beginner and still be a disciple and so we've been talking about a lot of the heavy weight of bearing god's name right that is that is intense and we should be taken with intensity but that does not mean that we are not given grace right. in this process. And that is the purpose of discipleship, to be given grace when we fail and be constantly stumbling closer to the throne of God. Yep. This is and why so, this is why the greatest, the greatest in the church, the saints, if you will, one of the prayers that they continually pray is. Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. You would think that that doesn't make any sense. But if you pray, if you start praying that, it might start making sense. So you can be raw and an incomplete beginner because you will need to pray that prayer your whole life. I will need to pray that prayer my whole life. And hopefully I sin less and less, but...